We have 20, over 20 of you with us on Zoom. We're so happy you joined us. And could you please just chat in a hello um, to our guest, Damond Hill from Berkeley. And so he can look later and know who was with us. And um, feel free to say anything about yourself because we have some new guests we don't know. So we um, are excited, really excited. Oh, there's Eric who co-runs AME Lab. He's on vacation. I didn't know he was going to join us. Hi, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had the pleasure of meeting Demond Hill, who is a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Darwin is going to give him a, a fuller introduction because he's doing some, probably the only person in the world who's doing this type of research, looking at emotional well-being interventions and um, really understanding in a qualitative way how these play out in a black sample rather than in the university weird white sample that they were developed on and learning a lot of really interesting rich material. So we got to do a talk with him for a joy summit. So it was a public talk. We were all scientists. And so it was very challenging. And even though I've done this for 30 years, I was really nervous. And I was like, guys, we're going to practice and practice. We're scripted. Yeah. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, I was stressing everyone out. And then Demond was like, you know what? We're just going to have fun. I can't do the scripted thing. We're just going to see how it unfolds. And I was like, ah, yeah. that's a really good idea. And it went so well because you shifted me from gazelle to lion. So thank you. From the stress you. out gazelle, Wendy's not here, but I'm just kidding. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce. Mm -hmm. Darwin Guevara, our amazing postdoc here. Um, I hope you can see the video. We're going to try to get you a link of our Joy Summit video um, so you can see what, so what I was talking about, because that was a really exciting thing to see you guys also present in a holistic way. Um, Darwin. Yeah, it was, it was great. And uh, you know, I, I can attest that Alyssa did stress us out. <laughs> it was a very stressful time. And Devon was like, oh, by the way, why don't we just have fun with this? And, uh, is, um, it was all good afterwards. So, um, uh, Damon Hill received his BA at Edgewood College, which is in Wisconsin, Madison. Is it, you're from the Midwest. Yep. Yeah. Um, the home of the best cheese curds in, in all of the United States. Yep. Uh, he then received his MA in Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, it's in my top five favorite cities in the United States. So it's great. Do you sailing? No, no, all right. Um, and he's currently a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley in the Department of Social Welfare. Uh, his research interests are focused on the intersection of black children, black youth, black families, and the possibilities, I'm gonna leave the impossibilities, and the possibilities of black healing, joy, and beauty. Um, he uses critical theories in his research to examine the development of black children and youth and the role of family in their lives. Um, he's currently a counselor, a mental health provider at um, Bayview uh, in San Francisco. Um, he has a background as a former educator and youth worker. Uh, he's committed to collectively creating a liberatory world for black children, black youth and black families. And as a community-based scholar, uh, Daman is unapologetically dedicated to advancing social justice and equity for marginalized communities. So if we can give Daman a hand. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, super grateful to be here. The, I thought that I could be able to walk from um, Bayview as like I work at Charles Drew Elementary School. That was not the cutest walk. So I'm taking deep breaths, but um, the babies were full of love today. It was interesting seeing them run around and be expressive. It's been a little off because last week was their spring break. So now they're kind of finding their way back in, into place. And I think in some ways I am too. Um, but again, it's really nice meeting you all. I'm super, super appreciative. It's great to see Maria here. Um, another lab partner of mine um, doing beautiful, beautiful work. So I um, was fortunate enough to have become, um, I guess in some shape or form, a summer 
fellow with the Greater Good Science Center. Um, Dacher Keltner is one of my um, advisors at UC Berkeley. And I'm also being supported by a sociologist by the name of Linda Burton, who has done some like really big scale studies, um, especially in the South and looking at different contexts. Um, the two of them came together to kind of encourage me to take on a, a, an interesting task or role with my research. Um, and with the DACA support alongside um, another, um, I guess you can say like fellowship or funder, they wanted to really explore their happiness practices on their Greater Good website. There's about 15 of them. Um, I'll explain in different ways the actual names of them and then um, some of the participants' responses to those practices. The funder who was the most interested or not necessarily interested, um, but everyone was interested, but the funder was kind of looking at the page and had some question marks about who are these practices for? Um, um, there's another scholar at UC Berkeley that's in our lab who had did some quantitative studies that found that a roughly like 85 to 90 percent of anybody using the Greater Good website, in particular, these 15 practices were white folks, and then I think a high number was white women, obviously. And so they wanted to figure out a way just to make it a little bit more open, a little bit more accessible, and in particular, a little bit more culturally relevant. It's, it's a little dry, um, just to be honest. So that was the basis of it. I'll go deeper into who the heck I am, but wanted to make sure like this is a particular study that was done over the summer. I'll explain how it was, but in the larger way, I'm taking what we found to kind of think deeply about some, some other concepts and ideas. So just to start off, I love, um, all my pictures have a purpose. So laugh, have fun, be silly, whatever it takes, but I just want to make sure um, that that is clear. My pictures are in alignment with, with anything and all things that are on my slides. So just want to start with James Baldwin, someone that I, I love to death. Um, and their quote, which is, love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the touch and universal sense of quest, daring, and growth. I love stuff like this. Um, I always sit with, and always question all the time, like um, if I put James Baldwin in a room with Paul Ekman, what would happen? And I think some, <laughs> some interesting stuff would come up, right? And I do think James Baldwin was a great emotions scientist. I, I do think Toni Morrison was a great emotion scientist. And I am on my own quest to figure out different ways that I can translate what they were trying to tell us and talk to us about, um, and then ground that, I think, in some like really cool qualitative methods. So just like my quick table of contents, um, I will be doing a quick little liberatory wake up activity with you all. It's nothing crazy. You won't be jumping up and down or anything. But I just want to get the gears rolling and ideas flowing. I'll do a little quick research background, my positionality. I think that is super important. Um, and it comes up a, a lot in different ways that I'm engaging with people. I'll motivate the study. And then I'll do some setting of the stage just to help us um, kind of get back to what really the greater good was looking for and wanting. And then I will blow that all up um, around the research methodology and research finding section. And then I'll leave off with like I say playful question marks, but I want you all just to dig at me. Um, I'm trying to figure things out and seek for something. So I wanna do that in community with you all. So quick yearning for belonging. I'm, I'm always yearning to belong. Um, I think as we walk around, as we just see the Bay itself, as San Francisco itself, Sometimes it's hard to belong. Um, we're moving and grooving. People got things to do. People got places to go. But also there are large disparities. 10 minutes up the street, Bayview Hunters Point is a place that is not being taken care of by the same people that live right here. And I have to make sure that is known um, because my babies should be um, and, and can be here 
Um, they deserve to be here. They deserve it to be in these types of environments. And I just wanna make sure that we're tying that really closely. So 10 questions, we can sit with them now, we can wait till later, we can play with them, you can write them down, whatever you want. But my first question is, who loved you into the person you are today? What emotion best defines you? I probably would say crazy for myself. <laughs> what emotion best defines your childhood? Does two and three intersect, do they connect? When did they break or bridge away? Four and five, on a scale of one to 10, how do you see yourself emotionally? And then how do you see other people emotionally? Did your family talk about or openly express emotions? And I think, in, in, if so, in what ways did they primarily? What do you remember learning about emotions or feelings growing up? And then the last few are just, what makes you feel? Um, when is the last time you felt something internally that moved you externally? Within your everyday world, what is emotionally required of you? How do people position you emotionally? And then lastly, when, in the, when is the last time you were playful and what did it spark for you as well as others around you? So if people are open to talking now, we can. You wanna to wanna to toss anything out there? So me. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to yeah. raise our hands? Okay, and go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Go well, ahead, go ahead. Having been in your shoes, I know it's nice when people answer. So, <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I'll pick. I'll pick emotion that best defines you. I don't know if it's an emotion, but it's sort of curiosity and wonder, sort of like a ballpark. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not going to answer all of them. I won't. <laughs> Unless you want to. But. Uh, answer whatever you like. Um, what, with, let's do nine. I think that's an interesting one. Within your everyday world, what is emotionally required of you? I would say a lot of regulation mm -hmm. uh, at work, particularly. A lot of, a lot of regulation and reframing. And, I'm, else? and then, yeah, and then I'm playful all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being brave. Anyone else on Zoom want to speak up or chat in to Demand? I can go. Hi, Demand. Hi, Scholar. Hey. hey. <laughs> Um, I, I really like answer 10. I feel like I've been a bit more playful than I normally am in grad school this past semester. So I've been going skating um, and it has been just bringing out the joy that I remember being eight, having my skating ring birthday parties, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it sparked just like happiness. Like I just felt free and was in my own like headspace. So that felt really good. Um, and the emotion that best defines me in childhood, I was just eager. I was always quick to jump into something. <laughs> and I still think I have that a little bit, but to um, the point made by Anne, I think it's definitely like regulated. Like you have to, unfortunately, like the social world has like made that feel a little bit more regulated. I can share out in the room. I'll like speak in the room. Um, you know, I find it really interesting. When we hit question four and five, it felt like everything was just out of focus. So many things came to mind of like, who's around me? What's the setting? I don't know. So it was like, I couldn't pick a number and it just was a scale that's constantly fluctuating. Um, and the same in the work that I do, it's like, I see people as very emotional, whether they're in tune or name it or not. Um, and so that five was a lot easier than saying myself emotionally. I think it's speaking to what the others have said. There's this like training of regulation and numbing and like muting of self emotion, especially when you're in the work of holding and seeing other people's emotions. 
Um, and so it makes less space and room to be an emotional being or own oneself as an emotional being. Um, and then I'll also answer one, thinking of emotions. Um, the person who loved me into who I am today, uh, most saliently is my mother. Um, so my biological mother and my sister who also play the role of mother. So um, my mom's there who loved me today. Thank you. Thank you all. I think, and just to be transparent, these questions I didn't make. So these are my participants' questions. Mm -hmm. they, they brought this back to the table. Um, a lot of them were very interested in different ways of reshaping and redesigning the study itself. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that they had a role in it because I was really using all of their knowledge to kind of, I guess, profit in some shape or form. So I had to give something back to them in some way. So in a lot of ways, these are their questions. In a lot of ways, he said the same things you said. Um, and you'll see our the interview process was about supposed to be 45 to 60 minutes. It ended up being like two hours of sitting and talking to people because it turned into like therapy for them. Sometimes for a lot of them, it was their first time actually like letting things go, um, forgiving, discussing. So you'll see some of that in some of the quotes. However, um, yeah, save it. Thank you. So yeah, research background. I am um, born and raised, partly raised in Columbus, Mississippi. So I'm very much so a country boy all through and through. Um, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, or my family, parts of my family moved to Racine, Wisconsin, very short. Um, we found our way to Madison, Wisconsin, searching for, I guess, cheap rent and safety um, for a lot of reasons and ended up staying way too long, y'all. <laughs> um, and was fortunate enough, um, my, original, my original plan was that I was going to go play professional football. Um, got pretty close to it. Um, got recruited, did all the fun things, went to um, a prep school or a prep school of some sort for sports um, that got me um, a lot of recognition for, for my abilities young and everything kind of crumbled underneath me pretty soon. Um, around my junior year, I think just life became life um, and life very quickly. Um, and all of my dreams kind of just went with it. And so I bounced around from, my goodness, I transferred probably five or four universities before my sophomore year of undergrad, um, where I ended up landing at Edgewood College. Prior to that, I was um, interested in education, but not necessarily wanting to fully fall into it yet. Um, Edgewood is where I did end up getting my ed degree, moved on to um, UW Wisconsin, where, Actually, I was in African American studies originally, and then as people found out that I used to be in it, they really quickly grabbed me uh, very fast. So that is my home department. I met some incredible, incredible thinkers who kind of helped me figure out what I was even doing. Um, and then in, in a lot of ways, my positionality, I love the heck out of everybody. I'm not, I try to love as much as I can, I really do. But there's something about my people that make me just want to get up every day, um, especially going to work when I see little black children, little brown children running around wanting and desiring connection. Um, it just reminds me of the times that I was wanting and desiring connection, but I wasn't getting it. Um, so it just makes me want to get up and do something. And then I just love my people. So it shows in my work. I'm not afraid to let that be, but I'm also a real scientist and I'm seeking to be a real scientist. So I make sure that is, that is known and it comes out in my work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. So just planting the seeds really quickly. Um, emotions such as happiness are supposed to be central to one overall well-being. That's what all the books say. Um, and one of the things that kept coming up is just like how one feels about themselves in the world around them. Like, I guess, uh, can predict or you can begin to think about or encourage or promote well-being. Um, and then you have a lot of scholars who understand emotions such as happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, blah, blah, blah. 
as universal. I think that's more of a, a classical view. A lot of scholars have moved away from that, but that is still very much so, you know, the base or foundation for a lot of our, our knowledge and very much so important as well. Um, however, marginalized communities encounter an array of obstacles that negatively impact their emotional well-being, right? Well-being, period. Um, in a lot of marginalized communities are experiencing depression, anxiety, death is all around all the time. It feels like go on Instagram, I'm seeing something. Um, it's just a lot all the time. Um, and just recently, or not just recently, I came across um, a study that sh showed that Black children under the age of 13 years old were committing suicide twice the rate of everybody else. So um, I guess they're now sounding the alarm on Black suicide or um, Black youth suicide. So things are just not right. And there's something there. Um, but also in the name of a lot of people that I love dearly, there's a lot of beauty happening and existing as well. And we have to make sure we're acknowledging the both and capturing the both in our work. So as you know, marginalized communities, all of us have developed some really sophisticated ways of being and existing amidst a lot of mess. Um, any and all of us have figured out ways to communicate under the table, um, to make do with nothing. And I think that's where a lot of cool stuff come from. One of the focuses that, um, one of the areas I like to focus on a lot is black vernacular English. I think it's something really cool. Um, especially in the ways that we talk about emotions and how people tell you how they're feeling. Might, might be, they might not say I'm angry, but they'll say, don't play with me. And that clearly lets you know, <laughs> okay? These things let you know. And I like that. Um, that's a cool way of another way that you're gonna see in the data, how a lot of my participants were like, I'm not necessarily interested in happy as my term. I'm gonna tell somebody I'm happy. I might tell them a different phrase, which is really rich, cool. Um, and make a point very clear, or actually I'm gonna jump into motivating questions because I wanna to get to the to other stuff is, um, big questions that we sat with as a team, we went all over the place, but we just kept coming back to how does it feel to be black, period. I think that's enough. Um, and I think my grateful for my team, for them believing in us as enough of a question to motivate, um, and have some ideas. And the second question we were kind of sit, sitting with is what is necessary in radically healing um, amid racial inequality? Can we even, is that even something we should be considering and thinking about? Okay. So this is the study. Um, we were sitting, we found that um, in a lot of ways, I'm lucky, I, again, I'm lucky I have a great team who lets me just talk crap all the time. They're great. Um, but we were really sitting with, okay, is the research really looking at race? Is it looking at, if we're not really interested in race in terms of an idea, if we're not interested in certain things about race, can we consider racialization? Can we consider blackness? Can we consider certain things? and how that might be shaping how people are even understanding, experiencing, engaging with um, emotions. And I personally think, um, and I would I say a lot of people agree is that there's just a lack of racial specificity. We gotta get clear. Um, and in particular, we have to start to invite into the literature the experiences of black folks that's also the experience of Native folks, that's the experiences of transgender folks. We have to start to really grapple with that because that does allow for rich, interesting work. Um, as a scholar, that is what I should be doing um, and encouraging others to do. So Greater Good Science Center and Karuna Happiness Foundation came together and said, go and do this. Um, so some of the themes that we came up with is we wanted to kind of unpack the inner childhood memories or inner childhood emotions. We wanted to sit with experiences with injustice and racism. I think that's important, especially for that website page. We wanted to grapple with understandings, experiences, and expressions of positive emotions, but we also found our um, participants not so interested in talking about positive emotions in the ways that we would 
um, as ways that we would. And then understand of understanding of happiness. Why is it even important? What prevents happiness? Why are we so obsessed with it? <laughs> And then lastly, culturally relevant wellness practices and making a clear point how originally culturally relevant wellness practices have been kind of molded to look very differently than what they had intended to look. Um, people have made sure that they held on to these wellness practices. However, we know that a lot of places have sh shifted them. And then we have 15 subsets. So this is where Grigio did a great job at creating this huge library of research backed um, little things you could do to make yourself happy. Um, and people loved it. They got small talk, um, active listening, and capitalizing on positive events, love and kindness meditation. Um, I love picking on raisin meditation because it was just, the most interesting thing. So you can go onto the website, you can click onto any of these 15 subset practices, but will come up as a long list of steps that you can take and then you just go out and practice it. So the raisin meditation one I like, um, I love to pick on because it's silly to me, but I can see why folks would like it. Take a little raisin, literally, and the steps are at, as such, hold it in your hand, touch the raisin, you look at the raisin, you put the raisin up against your face, you put the raisin in your mouth. What does the raisin taste like? Don't chew the raisin. Can you feel the ripples in the, like all of this mess? And my participants ate it alive. Um, it was funny to hear them talk about it. Um, they even put little cool twists on how you could still do that, but not be so corny about it. And yada, yada. <laughs> so it was really cool. Um, and then two things um, that you might necessarily see in the study um, as of yet, because we're still trying to figure out how can we do more, is actually the body scan meditation, the walking meditation, and the all walk. A lot of the participants were really, um, were really like intrigued by the body scan meditation in particular, just because as we're moving, grooving all the time, when do we actually take the time to just sit in a chair and scan your body? Not looking at, but just like feeling things. Um, am I well? Like, is my knee hurting? Is my back hurting? How is my head feeling? A lot of them even were just like, I do it in this way, but I've never used the term before. Um, and even are now on their own journeys to kind of grounding themselves in that practice even a little bit more. So, quick three questions that kind of like helped us, we were really focused on, we wanted to address, which is what is necessary in making each happiness practice relevant, appealing and engaging to Black and African-American populations or participants? What can the centering of Black and African-American perspectives on practices of happiness reveal about our understandings of wellness practices and their importance at large? And then three, how do Black and African-American communities utilize happiness, either as an object, um, as a term, you name it, to create, survive, or resist? And then these are just my three theoretical um, frameworks that I use. I love using dynamics of othering and belonging. I think it's just a cool way of just talking about a lot of things all at once. Um, an integrative framework on emotions is coming from Deborah Lupton. Um, they have a really, really cool piece or an entire book where they kind of go over everything you could want to know about emotions from a positive standpoint all the way to um, affect theory. And then last is just taking into consideration just ecological systems, just everything is happening to us. Um, our families are a part of it. Large systems are a part of it. If we don't know, or if we're not grounding that in our work, I think we're kind of missing um, a lot of people. And then just quick, because this was a mess. Um, the just overall literature review that I had to sit with, Lord of mercy, was the inner child. So I, again, just exploring dynamics of emotional othering and belonging, 
which was a particular focus on um, child, like early childhood neglect. Um, a lot of trauma was coming up. Um, we went into Sean Jinwright, who talked a lot about um, radical healing. So that is where we were kind of trying to build a case. And then the last two areas is like really taking seriously anti-Black racism um, and allowing that to kind of tell us a little bit, or give us some insight into the experiences of Black folks in the United States, um, which has came up with some rich things. Those are scholars like Michael Dumas at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, you have Kiara Ross, who is at Northwestern. These are really great scholars doing great work. But this is also coming from the tradition um, of Derek Bell. This is coming from the tradition um, of Gloria Latson buildings. And then third is an integrative overview. This is just went deeply into the emotions um, scholarship. So kind of just wanted to understand all the disciplinary perspectives and figure out which one fits and when and why. So ooh, move too fast, y'all. So very qualitative. Um, the only method we used within this three-month study was quick, y'all, I'm telling you, too fast, was um, narrative interviews. But what we did do on the side were weekly journals and diaries. So I had a lot of the participants drawing out things. Um, I think um, one of my participants said, why are you always telling me to talk? So I draw. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Um, what we did, it was myself and an undergrad. Um, and we just read it all. Um, read all the data, all the memoing. We developed preliminary themes that you'll see. These themes are still fluid. So we don't know if they're even solid enough yet. Um, but we're still playing with a lot. And then I just we just brought it all together to try to write something as best as we could. Research site, I, the US is very here. I know that's a huge problem, a uh, little bit too much focus on the US sometimes. But just so we know, my participants were from the West Coast, had some participants in the Midwest, the South and the East Coast. And then it was virtual as well as in person. Mm -hmm. um, the sample population intended to be 50. That's because I'm crazy. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't have done 50 in, in a month. So we had to bring it down to 10 um, and be very clear. The original study was going to be a little bit more broad. We're going to look at folks of color. And then we had to be critical that the usage of folks of color often kind of either neglects some or focuses, hyper focuses on others. So we want to be specific about what we were talking about and engaging with. Um, and then we allow for individuals to tell us, I identify as such, um, or allow for us to like say like, we have some participants in our sample who are like, you would look at and say you're black, but they didn't identify as such. So mm -hmm. we put them in a different category mm -hmm. for future research. Five identified as male, five identified as female. We did go a little bit into sexuality, which was a little bit more interesting and you'll see some of that coming up. And then we had teachers, a lot of occupations, farmers, construction workers, sex workers, self-employed, and more. And then the data sources, again, just interviews, some journals, um, and then as you see, a three-month study very quick. So the research findings, three big areas that we really like took all this, a lot of two hours of Transcribing, oh Lord have mercy. It was a lot, there's a lot there. A lot could take us other places and a lot can get you lost. Um, so we wanted to make sure it was as broad, broad enough where we didn't feel like we were making too large of claims um, but, and also broad enough so when it's time to sit back with more data, with more time, we can be a little bit more clear about what we're looking for and looking at. So broadly, we wanted, big thing that came up is a complete neglect of the Black experience. They critiqued the mess out of the happiness practices. This is where they really were like, ah, ah, ah. we love it. <laughs> the second um, was actually, we think we can improve these happiness practices too. We can critique them, um, but as such, we're gonna fix these for you. Yeah. And they were very open and interested in doing that. And then lastly, they left us with some nuggets. They were like, I don't necessarily think this is the way to improve it, but before we even can think about happiness, before we can even think about um, like 
Yeah, before we can think about a lot of things, there's some things we need to consider way, way, way before, which are some cool stuff. So real quick, y'all. So we took the large um, concept and just tried to break it down in three ways where the data kind of like fit in different interesting ways. And so we have stuff around anti-Black racism, respectability politics, and policing. Respectability politics is something that I really, really like. Um, a scholar by the last name is Harris um, did a really cool study or a really cool just scan of how Black children are actually um, in the school site, how anti-Black racism and respectability politics mold to kind of shape policies in school. So we got Black children who are getting their hairs chopped off because it's not and doesn't fit whatever policy that is available or that, it, that the school is, is pushing out. Um, and then you have kids such as like in Madison, Wisconsin, where a little black girl was slammed because she sprayed perfume on herself in the classroom. They slammed her and dragged her out of, the, out, of the, out of the class. So there's things where it's like, we want you to do what we say we want you to do. Um, and then when folks are pushing up against that, harm and violence is occurring to them. Even when they're fitting in that mold, harm and violence is also still occurring. So one of the participants sighed and said, I think people do a lot of policing of black folks. And then they sort of come up with things like the 15 happiness practices that don't do anything for me. So it's, it's, it's like a, it's a cool thing when I start to like even sit and break it down, like you police us and then you tell us go be happy. Historical trauma and radical healing. One of the participants shared that black people are always taught to be grateful. It goes back to the slave mindset. Like, yes, master, you did the great for me. If you want to ask me how to make these culturally relevant, the practices, can people start telling me how they're grateful for me? So I can stop feeling like I have to work 10 times harder than the other person just to get to the same place. My part, I pushed my participant in this way too. I, I, rem I remember that one clearly. I just, I asked them, I said, do you feel like you're not at this, do you feel like you're working 10 times harder to be at the same place? Or are you working 10 times harder and ahead of them? Um, have you progressed? Have you moved forward? And it was some hard conversation, um, but my participant was firm and that they are working 10 times harder. They're not getting somewhere. There's like a glass ceiling above them. And they're trying to figure out ways to kind of break through it. And one of them that they're struggling with the most is that the emotional state, I can't figure out how to express and be myself, especially in places and spaces that are not always designed for me. And then third was the privilege and not the marginalized. Kind of having a very too much of a focus on people who have privilege to participate in these things. So some of the participants mentioned five different areas where they're noticing um, some inaccessibility, which is too time consuming. Some of the practices take a little too long. If you got three or four kids, even if you have one kid, it's hard to do some of these practices. <clears throat> Two, it's ineffective when the main concerns in life are just too much to handle. Some of our participants were you know, experiencing homelessness Meh, you know, like sometimes it's just a little difficult. I got P's and Q's, I got to focus on one before the other. Um, but there's an issue with, you know, putting our well being and mental health aside. Um, but some of us don't have the ability to center that or opportunities to center that. Three is unable to access safe environments to engage. A lot of my participants live in cities, inner cities. Um, a lot of them talked about just, I don't have trees to look at, or I got to go too far out of the way to go. And if I go, will people be looking at me weird because I don't shouldn't be here. A lot of these, you know, things were coming up internally. And then the privileges, able-bodied individuals, um, just the term, you know, walk for a lot of folks can bring up a lot of emotions mm -hmm. that we do have to be mindful of. And then five, positivity does not solve oppression. We know that. So a list on improving these happiness practices. And so a lot of the participants brought up 
a little bit of centering blackness, a lot about different ways to like actually allow for us to talk about emotions. Um, and then how do we not just talk about self-expression, but like a radical form of it, how I dress, how I look, how I, everything. Can I show up the way I need to show up? Three was feeling race and culture, actually feeling it. Um, actually, let me go back up just to talk a little bit more. Participants were like, can a laugh do more than us talking about happiness itself? And that to me is interesting. Can a cry do more for us in terms of the way we think about it, conceptualize it? Can a yell or can just the opportunity to just be without all this? Yeah. Feeling race and culture. So just honoring the feelings that come from people of color. Um, we know that race and culture impact our experiences and everything around our, how we think about emotions. Um, and I have been really interested in this area and found a really cool book called Mastering Emotions by Aaron, Aaron Austin Dury, who really sat with, um, did a full scan on how the South during the antebellum um, used emotions in everything to talk about harm. Um, and they did a great job at pulling from um, archives, did a great job of finding old books. Um, they like used to have like manor pamphlets that had a lot of stuff about emotions in it, um, which was like blew my mind in a lot of ways. And then I think the big thing and, and one that I think we can start first is just shifting from individual to the collective. Uh, the practices felt a little bit too individualistic um, and we need to start thinking about the communal aspects and perspectives of these practices. Can that actually breed, um, I guess, a longer, like a sustained happiness versus something that might be a little too temporary um, or short term? Maybe or maybe not. And then quickly, um, they just wanted us to consider some things. Big thing was mapping emotional childhood memories. Um, this is where we are at right now in terms of the team. We are mapping them, literally. Um, we have some participants. We have some questions about your early childhood and the connections that we're doing. We're doing, um, what, do, what do they call it? Not a mind map, but almost in some shape or form, we're like, literally putting arrows to certain things and then allowing for them to kind of term and not like put a term to it that they feel comfortable with. Um, so the big critical question that kept coming up was what are the people, places and things that make you feel safe enough to just be? Do you miss those places? Have you gotten too far away from the things? And then Joanna Macy and Despair Work has a really cool quote that I always love and talk about, which is, the refusal to feel takes a heavy toll. Not only is there an impoverishment of our emotional and sensory life, but this psychic numbing also impedes our capacity to process and respond to information. I know sometimes when I'm a mess, I can't even listen to anybody, um, let alone even just get up. The energy expended in pushing down despair is diverted from a, for more creative use, depleting the resilience and imagination needed for fresh visions and strategies. We all know that. And then lastly, centering a critical perspective on love. This was huge. This is bell hooks. This is a lot of amazing people who are like, if you don't center a love ethic in any of these things that you're doing, whether it's your research, whether it's you taking care of your grandma, anything, um, even being in this space with me, if we're not here from a place of love, then you know we have to we have to do get back to that. We have to, as a team, center ourselves a little bit more. And that love ethic, I love this quote, um, requires us to critically interrogate our location, the identities and allegiances that inform how we live our lives, so we can begin the process of decolonization. And if folks are not really wanting to sit with decolonization, just the process of living. Um, and just significance and contributions, we don't know, we're trying. Um, I think the big thing in terms of like, just obvious is we're centering something that not often gets centered. Um, 
we're showing love and appreciation to something that often does it. And I think the big thing for greater good is that, yeah, they get an opportunity to kind of look publicly like they're doing something interesting. We know a lot of these social justice focused things always are not real deal. Um, but I think when black and brown folks are looking to do something about their health and they see what is on that website, maybe a little comfort can come at that. But maybe that can be the foundation for which they start to dream and imagine something new, um, which is what we want for people. And then last, this is it, y'all. Sorry, sorry. I don't like talking a lot. So that's just references. Um, but our playful question marks is cultivating a radical and liberatory practice. So just a number of questions here. Tell me, are we too optimistic or not optimistic enough? Um, how do feelings or emotions stick to and move through the world around us? How do I advance this topic? What am I missing? Oh, you're right. We still have 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. We'll go back Just, to your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, everyone on Zoom, if you um, can, any, is anyone typed in so they can monitor the questions for Daman? Rush, do you have a computer? I can. I can. Okay. This one, yeah. um, so, so why don't we take any first question from the room? I just want to say thank you so much. That was just so beautiful, rich, and beautiful, beautiful research methods. It shows what you can do going deep without a lot of subjects. I mean, just um, and bringing bringing in so much um, theory and lived experience is amazing to see. I'm a fan of the the comment that you made. Uh, um, I think it might have been like the third result results slide where uh, greater good really focuses on the individual. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. that's not the best approach when we're trying to increase. There should be some sort of group practices, group mm -hmm. collective kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that applies you know, to a lot of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I thought that was particularly interesting. And I really, really like the whole positivity does not solve oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I thought it did before I heard you say it. Um, we wish, we hope. Yeah. But I mean, I think something that I always, or that a lot of scholars have talked about is like, or who, who just talked about it? I just seen a post about it recently. I think it said Maya Angelou was talking to Dave Chappelle. <laughs> and um, in a little quick clip, she said that um, anger is powerful. And like, you need to speak out on that anger. You need to create that anger. You need to make art from that anger. Um, and I thought that was beautiful as well. What Dave said? Dave was just quiet. Like <laughs> <laughs> no jokes from Dave. Yeah. When auntie is talking, you quiet. <laughs> You know, I have a question. It sounds, you want to tell them what you do here? Uh, yeah, my, so my name is Kari as well. I'm the uh, Undoing Anti-Black Racism advisor for our department. So I'm really focusing in on undoing anti-Black racism. And I just want you to talk a little bit more. Oftentimes, you know, we have diversity is the way to kind of get around into these things. But oftentimes, Black folk are kind of missing in that range of diversity. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more of how you went through that journey of starting with a more broad, diverse group and then wanting to really focus in on uh, the uh, anti-black racism. Yeah, I would have to first like give all the, well, first of all, you're doing good work here. Um, it's, it's amazing. And got to give credit to my family at Wisconsin Madison. It was a true family. So people like Virginia, um, people like Bianca Barridge, we had this huge room and they hammered down. Um, so early on we were having, when I was in those spaces with them, I actually was a little bit more interested in like the concept or idea about multiculturalism. I was really like a fan, but that's because I was in Madison, Wisconsin. I thought we all could come together. And woo -woo. <laughs> um, but I think over time you start to realize like who gets, who's missing consistently um, and the actual harm 
in that term or the practices that like flow from that from multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. So we really critiqued it right away. And folks got very sharp about when we are looking at a lot of research that says people of color, it's almost like this, like, I don't wanna necessarily say like, there's like this like ignorant scan um, where we know you're talking about black folks, but you just don't wanna say it. Or we know who you're talking about. And we started to reflect on, is it more powerful for us just to name the name or name the thing I'm going to give respect to the thing and actually sit with it versus trying to always include everything and everyone in, in the research. There's points in time for that, but I think there's also points in time to really hone in and focus. So the greater good was open to that idea. Um, and it was not a push at all. They, were, they knew that we had to focus on a particular population that's just not showing up um, or that we're just not speaking to. Alicia? Hey, Alicia? Is that me? Yeah, hi. Okay, cool. Welcome. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Alicia Roberts. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. This is an amazing talk um, and much respect to what you did. I feel like this is a lot of very interesting things that need to be discussed as much as humanly possible, in my personal opinion. Um, I did have a question, though. Um, for you, Damon, I was wondering how how this experience was for you, like researching all of these things and covering a lot of heavy topics, like especially as a Black person and obviously a lot of like Black history and Black research isn't, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of positive things. There are a lot of positive things to highlight, but there is also a lot of like um, like hardship and challenging things that have to be addressed as well. So I'm just really curious um, how your experience was doing this research. Yeah, um, a little depressing, probably, to be very honest. It was just, I think the, the thing that hurt the most was like, sometimes I walk through the world and I can be, I can be a little, a hole, especially like when I see folks, I'm like, oh, I can have opinions. Um, you didn't hold the door for me, or <laughs> you stink. Like I'm all, I just can get an attitude really quickly. Um, and I think sitting with my participants, it reminded me that a lot of folks are just hurt and hurt from an early, early age. And a lot of these grown people living in the world are like so protective of their inner child mm -hmm. and. They're trying to do everything and anything that they can do. Um, and sometimes they either lose sight of people around them. Sometimes they get so internal. Um, and it was like a huge reflection point for me that like there are some, there are some things I need to work on. Um, and it brought up a lot of my own. I wanted to map out my childhood. And prior to that, I had no therapist, but now I do. Um, and I talked to him every Thursday. So it was, it, there was some points where it brought up a lot for me, but it also opened up me in ways that I needed. Thank you. That was beautiful. Appreciate that. Yeah. Even did you have a question? Oops, yeah, do you have, do we have time though? Yeah, we're gonna anyone who needs to leave right right at one, please um don't feel bad leaving and we're glad you're here, but we're gonna go five minutes over if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Okay, in that case. Um yeah, I was just I really I really liked the talk. Um and I especially like the part where um you said like um people of color might not resonate as much with the practices we already many people are using. And I was wondering like what you think about the effectiveness of those kinds of interventions. So like, is this about like people not engaging in those interventions as much, but like if they were to engage in those, maybe they'll still benefit from it. Like how introverts might not like the extraversion in, um, intervention, but they might still benefit from it. So like, do we have to, like, is the work more, should the work be targeted towards engaging people or just like changing the interventions per se, like tailoring the interventions some way to, um, yeah, to engage, that can work better for um, certain cultural groups? Yeah, that's a good question. It was, it'd be hard for me to pick one. So I would, I'm just gonna like do the traditional scholar thing and say both um, <laughs> because it's, because yes, like I wish that 
a lot of folks that look like me will go on more all walks, go into nature and see some beautiful stuff, dip your toes in the water, like get muddy, um, do all that, be playful. But then I also want to like, yeah, acknowledge that the practice of themselves need some, some changing. Um, and in particular, what they need changing in right now, I would say is just the, the way we're framing how to go about an all walk. Um, for some, when they read it, that is, that's enough for them to say no. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to make sure that the language that we're using and the way that we're describing certain practices um, are inviting to others and all people. Mm -hmm. And then I think before that, which um, um, a lot of greater good is moving towards is when you go onto the web, web pages itself, there ain't number of white folks on there. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if I go on this page, I see number of white people on exit out. <laughs> so for a lot of people, that's enough for them to, mm -hmm. to do that. And um, I think, you know, there's some work on both ends. You mentioned you know, people about some of the, the practices were corny. Mm -hmm. right? that a, being like a corny practice is a big barrier to actually starting it mm -hmm. probably, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's have people in the room can ask them on when we end. So we'll have one more question from the Zoom audience. And then I have one last question. I think, Sky, did you have a question? I did have a question. Um, so right now I'm in school for social work and I'm like thinking of like these larger institutions that like intentionally oppress black people specifically and other people of color. And I just wanna know like, how do you see this research applying to like larger institutions and like what things you think they can adopt to aid in, you know, this mindfulness, loving on yourself, you know, releasing traumas, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's two things when you say that, Sky, that come up. The first is, um, I always get their last name wrong, but Arlie Horschild came up with um, emotional labor, mm -hmm. the term, or in, in like the idea about feelings rules. And I've been really interested in inviting that conversation to folks who are like doing ground mental health work or care work. So like, what is required of you when you are working with populations that do have a lot of trauma? Like, how are you kind of regulating and creating feeling rules for yourself? How is the institution that you're working for doing it? How are you kind of negotiating that between the person you're caring for? I think that itself could be useful, especially for people working in these roles. Um, and, you know, the emotional labor that comes from this work as well. But I think at the institutional level or larger level, um, part of me is just like, uh, like, Part of me is just like, it's just designed to just wear you out and burn you out and replace you. Um, so I want to always like acknowledge that, but I think right now where my mind is and people will push back on this, it's like, I think like me as a person, I can't let that institution wear me out, burn me out until the day I'm in the grave. Um, so I think I'm trying to actively build a community space um, a family that resists with me, um, that protects me from these things that are kind of squandering me, rather than even, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Oh, such a beautiful question and answer. Uh, my, um, my last, my comment is a comment, not a question, and I would love um, both Perry and you to respond to it. And so it's just, you know, this wondering about what you think of what we're doing here. So we're in a medical institution. We have every type of systemic, there's systemic racism and hierarchy. And, you know, we, we're all here to do, to do good. The mission is to reduce suffering. You know, we're this healthcare institution. So everyone has their roles. And then we have, you know, a tiny minority of black members. And so, and then we're, you know, so I think this view that you have, especially leading the anti-black racism task force is just so relevant and interesting here. So the, the question is, what do you guys think of what we're doing? The very, one of the first things that, that Carrie picked up for us is these affinity groups. And we're looking at, um, I don't know if you can comment on this kind of body of, of knowledge, but we're, we're doing the, um, the somatic abolitionist curriculum that um, Resma Menachem laid out. Is that something you're familiar with? I have friends that talk about that. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, how's how are we doing? <laughs> You're here. Yeah. So, I, in, uh, if you're asking me in particular, I think that we have even comparison. In comparison, last a uh, couple years ago, I'll say, um, Dr. State put in five working groups that really looked at the different aspects of our department and came up with a series of recommendations, really to make it more inclusive and reduce uh, the anti-black racism. So, actually, it has gave us like almost a blueprint mm -hmm. or a, a plan to start moving on. So, it's not necessarily these conceptual ideas that I think often get put down to undo anti-Black racism. We're actually trying to look for concrete, impactful uh, change along with it. Mm -hmm. I really like the education and training that's coming along with the um, affinity accountability groups. The one thing that I want to continue to do and to push is sometimes, you know, we have affinity accountability groups. We meet once a month. We're doing the work with Resma, of Resma Nakin's book. Sometimes it can be self-selecting still of who is coming and into the door. So I really want in my work is to, we've, we've recognized that anti-Black racism has been institutionalized into a lot of places. I wanna start institutionalizing some of those changes that we can. So it's actually part of the system and not just like these patches that come during Black History Month or after someone's murdered in the streets, but that we have like a systematic approach, including a, I would say a training, just like we do with other communities so that we have a shared language, values, and can have those conversations that we need to have. Mm, yeah. I'm so excited to be part of that. I think, like, in, in alignment with that, like, asked in the room, I think a lot of people have asked this question probably, but, like, who's in here, like, willing to do what it takes to protect people who are marginalized, who are going through it? If you can really sit with yourself and say, I'm willing to do what's necessary to protect you, I'm doing what's necessary to protect you. That's not even a question that's coming to me. Um, I don't have to sit and ponder on it. But like I had to be like loved and cared into being in that position to be even like confident to say that. So I feel like if we can sit and ask us ourselves, yeah, I am. But if you're not, then that's gonna breed a culture where it's just gonna be, I would say performative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm on board with the with a culture that is like for real about what's real in life. Beautiful. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you so much. We're so honored to have you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank y'all. This will be a video on our um, AME uh, YouTube.